The final week of November was refreshingly crisp and frosty. The air started to carry the scent of an impending winter, the New Year's marvels, and lengthy holiday breaks. A lone car slowly traversed the road at a leisurely pace. It was a Sunday morning, and the highway was clear, allowing for uninterrupted driving without fear of traffic jams. Timothy relished this, a tranquil drive amidst silence and snow, what could surpass this? The heavy malachite green arms of the spruce trees contrasting with the white snow blankets. Suddenly, in the midst of all that white and green, he saw something orange covered with snow. Without knowing why, the man hit the brakes and went to take a closer look at the strange find. Child, what happened to you? he yelled, dropping to his knees to dust the snow off the child's overalls. What are you doing here? The girl didn't respond. She was about five or six years old, with round rosy cheeks and mittens covered in snow clumps. He bent lower, attempting to hear her breath. Her long eyelashes fluttered. She's alive. It's hot here, the little girl mumbled incoherently, attempting to unzip her overalls. Mummy, I'm hot. Need water. Just a moment, the man whispered, scooping up some snow with his hand, and bringing it to the girl's lips. She licked the snow, and immediately opened her large grey eyes. It's snow! You bet it is, Timothy grinned crookedly. And where's your mum? Mum? The girl furrowed her blonde eyebrows amusingly, trying to remember. Do you live around here? Please show me your house. She shook her head. He only now noticed that her knitted cap was wet from the snow. We took the bus, she said. Mum's probably home. Daddy and I walked here. And where is he? The girl looked around, confused. I don't know. Daddy said we were going to play hide-and-seek. He hid, and I had to look for him. I've been looking and looking, but he's nowhere to be found. I'm tired. I see, said Timothy. So let's do it this way. I'll take you to my house... You can warm up and drink some hot tea, and then we'll look for your mum. Let me carry you. He picked the little girl up easily and walked to the car. Just don't sleep, okay? We'll turn on the heater. What's your name? My name is Timothy. Avery, the little girl said. Twenty minutes later, upon entering his apartment, Timothy wrinkled his nose, greeted by the familiar silence and the stifling smell of medicine. This persistent odour pervaded everything, a constant reminder of his mother's illness. "'It smells like a hospital,' Avery remarked, wrinkling her little snub nose. Timothy set the girl on the floor and began unlacing her shoes. "'My mother is ill,' he explained. "'She is being cared for by a nurse. She gives her injections and medications. "'Are you hungry? I think we have pancakes. Do you like pancakes?' "'Are they with jam?' Avery asked, her eyes lighting up. "'With jam and honey and anything you want. But promise me,' Timothy said sternly, "'that you'll wash them down with some hot tea, okay?' "'Deal,' the girl agreed, shaking her wet mittens. "'Where can I dry them?' "'We'll find a place,' Timothy smiled, taking her hand. "'Let's go to the kitchen, shall we?' Timothy was right. The pancakes were still there, warm and ready to be devoured. Avery sat on a high stool, hungrily eating her treat and sipping her tea. Timothy left for a moment, returning shortly with a pair of warm woolen socks. "'I don't have your size, you know,' he said, pulling the socks over the child's cold feet. "'But these will do. The main thing is that they're warm.' The girl paused with the pancake halfway to her mouth and looked at him with a childlike intensity. "'Don't you have any children?' she asked in surprise. No, Timothy admitted, but I will have them some day. The girl fidgeted restlessly in the chair. Dad says he who has no children is a lucky man, she said, staring straight ahead. He says children are only trouble and loss, especially girls. Oh, your dad talks nonsense, Timothy said angrily, then added more calmly, well, I mean, your dad probably didn't mean it. He was likely just angry or exhausted at the time, so he said it without thinking. No, 
He says that every day, the girl said glumly, and Mummy cries and cries. Timothy was finally confused. It seemed that this little girl's family was the kind that even the enemy would not wish. What should I do now? Of course, I must find the girl's parents, but how can I give her back? She'll have to listen to her father's nonsense again. Let me pour you some tea, he said, awkwardly changing the subject. You aren't probably warm yet. Oh, there's Valerie. He looked at the nurse who had entered the kitchen. Hi, Valerie said tiredly. Her eyes were reddened. Clearly she had been up all night, due to Timothy's mother's insomnia. The poor nurse had spent the night reading aloud Dumas's novels. I heard your voice. I came to see who you were talking to. I thought it was the doctor again. But I was wrong. Who's this girl? She looked at the little guest, who was engrossed in dipping pancakes in jam, and seemed oblivious to her surroundings. Timothy had already realised that the little girl was not at all afraid of strangers. Meet Avery, Timothy smiled. She... she will be staying with us for the time being. Is she your friend's daughter? Valerie asked. Well, he hesitated, almost. How's Mum? The nurse sighed. I have no good news, Timothy. She hasn't slept all night again. We read and talk, but sleep eludes her. Her blood pressure is high and difficult to bring down. Well, you know how it is. Yeah, I know, the man said darkly. Listen, Valerie, I have to leave now. I have an appointment. But it shouldn't take long. Could you take care of our little guest? Give her a warm bath and then put her to sleep. She's been playing in the snow and is exhausted. Oh, of course, I'll look after her. Plus, your mother finally fell asleep, so don't worry. Avery? Do you like to have a bath? Valerie asked, and the little girl nodded cheerfully, her face smeared with cherry jam. Timothy stepped out of the house, inhaling the fresh air, devoid of the constant medicinal scent. It felt good. He had been growing uncomfortable at home, primarily due to his ailing mother. It was painful for him to watch, day by day, as a close person gradually passes away from this life, and he looked at it and couldn't do anything to help. Timothy had been caring for his mother for a year since they moved in together. He hired a professional nurse, paid for the best doctors, and catered to his mother's every whim. However, all of these efforts felt futile. He consoled himself with the thought that his mother's transition from one world to another would be as comfortable as possible. Timothy was so deep in thought that he didn't realise his phone had been vibrating in his pocket for a while. Hello? It was Timothy's mother's doctor on the line who was scheduled to visit her that afternoon. Timothy, good day. Can we talk? Yeah, is something wrong? Timothy said, settling behind the wheel. Checking his watch, he realised he had ten minutes to spare. So, what do you want to discuss? Look, the doctor began hesitantly. I reviewed all the x-rays again today, in chronological order. You know, a fractured femoral neck is not easy, especially for someone under 40. But your mother was lucky. It healed perfectly. She should be walking. Then why isn't she walking? Timothy asked, getting tired of the long-winded explanations. You've seen it yourself. She hasn't gotten up in a year. I remember. It's a bit of a mystery, but I don't think it's physiological. Then what is it? The doctor paused. You might need a good psychotherapist, Timothy. It might be something psychological. She could be fearful of re-injury, or there might be secondary benefits. Secondary benefits? What do you mean? Well, she's living like a queen. Everyone is attentive to her. She has a nurse. She's well-fed and pampered. Maybe she likes it. Maybe she's pretending to be sick. You mean she's faking it? I'm not saying that, but we can't rule it out. You'll need to find a psychologist. That's all I have to say. I will visit your mother tomorrow. See you. The phrase, secondary benefits, kept echoing in Timothy's mind. It was as if a hidden string deep within his soul had been struck, producing a grating sound that set his teeth on edge. He couldn't stop thinking about it, 
during a business meeting with his partners, and even afterward, he didn't know how to shake it off. Secondary benefits. What if it's true? He couldn't recall a time when his mother had seemed genuinely happy. He had always felt a pang of sympathy for her, as though she were perpetually unfortunate. Her relationship with her father was tense. While they weren't poor, and his father was neither a drinker, abusive, nor unfaithful, something vital was missing from their relationship. Perhaps it was simple human kindness. His mother was a chronic complainer, perpetually dissatisfied with something. Her husband, her son, life in general. Worse yet, she never tried to restrain herself. At best, she would adopt a distant gaze and mumble under her breath. More often, she would yell and shame. In response, his father would retreat to the garage to work on the car, silently escaping the constant accusing without uttering a word. Occasionally, he would retort, triggering a major argument that made home an unbearable place to be, and he left. Afterward, the woman would cry, lamenting her miserable life to her son, before dissolving into tears again. Timothy remembered how desperately he wanted to see his mother happy. He used to try to comfort her after each family dispute, and often made small child gifts for her. He was willing to give her everything, but it seemed as though she never noticed. She was perpetually saddened by the fact that her son was not an exceptional student. After parent-teacher conferences, she would return looking sorrowful, and with a sigh of disappointing, "'Nothing good. I'm very upset.' As Timothy grew older and started resisting her increasing control, a new kind of struggle began. His teenage outbursts became a cause for suspicion of drug use and speculation about his future profession. His mother predicted that he would become a janitor. Initially, Timothy felt hurt, but he eventually became used to it, even learning to disregard it. Such is her character, he thought with a philosophical calmness. He began to perceive his mother's screams as mere white noise. However, an incident closer to his graduation broke his patience. Excuses about his mother's character lost all significance. The girl's name was Marissa. She studied in a parallel class. Unexpectedly, as is the case, love struck them both, despite the fact they had barely noticed each other before. Timothy recalled how he bumped into Marissa in the school corridor, froze in front of her, blushed, and struggled to say something, to greet her, or just say anything. During the subsequent physics lesson, he tried to understand how he had previously overlooked her enormous, light-coloured eyes, which were as clear and serene as mountain lakes. Her eyelashes were long and as black as coal, and her braid was thick. He suddenly had a profound desire to see her blonde hair loose, imagining it to be as soft as silk and smelling of fresh grass, which had been his favourite scent since childhood. That day he received a D for failing to hear a teacher's question, and was scolded for his inattentiveness. But he wasn't upset. None of it mattered from now on. After school, he waited for Marissa on the porch. When she exited and saw him, she smiled brightly, like a spring day. "'I thought you had left already,' she said. Timothy wished to respond with something clever and funny, but nothing came to mind. Instead, he just took her backpack and grumbled. "'How can you carry such a heavy load? It's unhealthy. Come on, I'll walk you out,' he said. Marissa smiled slyly. "'I live nearby, over there.' She pointed to the nearest house. "'Well, then I'll walk you home, and then we'll go for a walk.' He kept quiet about his first romantic feelings at home, but he made the mistake of keeping a personal diary, where he detailed every encounter. Timothy and Marissa dreamt of sharing a life, but one day the girl vanished. Assuming she was sick, Timothy rushed to her home right after school. Her mother, stern-faced, opened the door. "'Is Marissa home?' Timothy asked. The woman gave him a disdainful look. "'No, and don't come here again. Marissa will be finishing her studies in another town.' "'Why? She didn't mention anything like that. She would have told me.' "'Your mother came to see us,' said Marissa's mother sternly. "'She said that because of Marissa, 
you've neglected your studies and started drinking beer too much. It's not true, he exclaimed indignantly. She claimed you were in bad company. I worry about my daughter. I don't want her associating with hooligans. So forget about her and don't come here again. She lied to you and you believed it. Timothy began to justify himself, but the door had already slammed shut. He sat on the steps, burying his head in his arms. So his mother had read his diary and concocted lies to dissuade the girl from him. Timothy felt a deep sense of violation, as though he'd been trampled on without any apology. Now, where shall I go? He thought wearily. In the past he would have gone home, but he now realized painfully that he had no home. A home is a place where people trust each other, not engage in deceitful schemes behind each other's backs. But the tragedy was that he had nowhere else to turn. Hearing the key rattling in the lock, his mother appeared in the hallway. She took in her son's distraught expression and barely suppressed a smile. I baked pies, she announced gently, with potatoes and with meat. Your favorites. Thank you, Timothy mumbled. I'm not hungry. I see, his mother responded, placing her hands on her hips. A rebellion, is it? Timothy quietly removed his shoes, hung his jacket in the closet, and then turned to face her. Why, Mum? he asked gently, but his voice was fraught with suppressed anger. Why what? I don't know what you mean. Why did you go through my things? Why did you lie to Marissa's mum? She sent her off to another town, and I'll never see her again, he accused with desperation in his voice. His mother's face was impenetrable. I had nothing to do with it, she responded. I don't know what you're talking about. Wash your hands and sit at the table. Why do you lie to me, mother? He asked tiredly. I've been told everything. I've told you clearly I had nothing to do with it, the woman insisted. I see, he said. You had nothing to do with it. And anyway, it was all my dream. I get it. Timothy retired to his room and sat on the bed for a while, studying the patterns on the wallpaper with detached wonder. It's strange, just this morning, I was sure that everything around me, the walls, the table, the bloody wallpaper pattern, was home. But it's all a lie. Not a home, but a cage where I was deceived into staying. How awful! The only consolation was that there were only three weeks left until graduation. After that, he could leave this place. He just had to wait a little longer. Timothy vividly remembered getting on the train, leaving his school friends on the platform. His mother hadn't come to the station. When she learned of his decision, she melodramatically clutched her heart, grabbed her blood pressure monitor and wept. When this didn't work, she tried her persuasion, which also failed. She then resorted to shouting and accusing Timothy of ingratitude. This could have continued indefinitely if his father hadn't intervened. Don't, Rachel, he said. You've brought this on yourself. Let him go. From home? Yes, or you'll ruin his life too. He looked at Timothy with understanding and sympathy in his eyes. Thanks, Dad, Timothy said gratefully. His father simply patted him on the head in response. As the train started moving, Timothy sighed with relief. I'm free. Now I can finally start my life. He didn't visit his parents often perhaps once a year at most, and he never stayed overnight. His mother resented his infrequent visits, but his father understood. During Timothy's first visit, his father asked him to help clean the garage. Timothy readily agreed, but upon entering the garage, he found it impeccably organized. "'Where's the mess you promised?' he asked cheerfully. Instead of answering, Dad pulled out several white envelopes from under the car seat. From Marissa, he said, offering a letter to his son. She wrote to you, as you see. But why didn't you give them to me immediately? Timothy replied, perplexed. His father's face turned red with embarrassment. Your mother was intercepting them, he admitted reluctantly. And I, well, I stole them from her. But don't be angry with her, son. Your mum's a difficult woman, but I'm certain she meant well. She just thought it was best for you. 
but you don't agree with that, Timothy stated flatly, or you wouldn't have given me the letters. His father ran his hands through the hair on the back of his neck, a habit he had when faced with a difficult conversation. You're an adult now, he finally said, but it's still hard for me to discuss this. Your mother and me, we perhaps rushed into marriage. It's not that either of us are bad or good. It's just that we are very different people, and maybe now that you're grown up, we can grant each other freedom and find happiness. You want to leave mum? Timothy asked. I... His father looked down, embarrassed, and paused. Then making up his mind, he looked Timothy in the eyes and said something he had been too ashamed to even admit to himself. Yes, Timothy, I want to leave her. Do you disapprove? His son knew how to appreciate honesty, and he only said, No, Dad, it's your decision, and I'll accept it. You're adults too. At home, of course, he said nothing to his mother about the letters, but on the train, taking him back to his studies and his new friends, he read them all. Marissa's letters were painful to read, and Timothy wiped away his tears when he thought no one was looking. In the first letter, Marissa described her situation. They had taken her old phone with all the contacts and replaced it with a new one that only had two numbers. Her mother's and her aunt's, who she was sent to live with. The aunt, according to Marissa's letter, was a stern woman who strictly made sure that her niece did not dare to go out after school. After lessons, Marissa was given two hours for homework, then expected to complete household chores. Her chores included cleaning, cooking dinner, and gardening. Her aunt checked her phone daily, regularly invaded her privacy, and reported to Marissa's mother about the progress of her re-education. In the second letter, Marissa wrote that she found a way to evade her aunt's constant surveillance. She would go to the basement to fetch vegetables and preserves, as her aunt disliked the damp. There she had a few minutes of privacy to write her letters. She wrote this one over the course of a week. If Timothy wanted to respond, he could send his reply to the address of Marissa's school friend, who would pass it along. The third letter from Marissa was brief. She wrote that she understood Timothy's reluctance to respond and promised not to impose on him any further. The same day, he got off the train and bought a bus ticket, eager to see Marissa and explain himself. He headed to the address of her school friend with a plan in mind. I'll try to get Marissa out and take her away with me right away. A tall girl with a black braid opened the door. Are you Timothy? She asked, grinning in response to his puzzled look. Marissa drew your portrait. She's good at drawing. It looks like you. Can you give me her address or phone number? Timothy asked. The girl shook her head, frowning. Her aunt married her off to some guy. They've left for the countryside. I haven't heard from her since. What village? What do you mean? Married her off? Couldn't she refuse? Timothy exclaimed in disbelief. She couldn't, sighed her friend. Her aunt locked her in the attic and beat her every day. She was given a choice. Get married or rot there. Tell me their address, Timothy demanded. I don't know it. They left at night without telling anyone and wouldn't let me see her. He went back the same evening and bought a bottle of some disgusting liquor at the bus station. Luckily, he, the autopilot instinct of his body, saved him from potential trouble, and Timothy managed to reach his dormitory. He awoke in the middle of the night in his bed, plagued by a terrible headache and thirst. A bottle of mineral water sat on the bedside table, and a basin was placed on the floor beside the bed. His neighbours, evidently experienced, had cared about him. God bless them, he thought, drinking the mineral water greedily before falling back into a deep sleep until morning, dreamless. Life went on. Timothy's father eventually left his mother, but did not live long. He passed away ten years later. He went to sleep and didn't wake up. An easy death, the doctors and friends at the wake commented, seemingly envious of the peaceful ending devoid of humiliation, fear or pain. Timothy funded the funeral and lingered at the grave, clutching a heavy bouquet of white roses. The stems pricked his hands, and their leaves were unpleasantly damp. "'Thanks, Dad. I love you and always will,' he whispered, gently laying the flowers on the grave. 
He and his father may not have been as close as he would have liked, but they were not distant either. His father had come to his aid during his most challenging moment. He understood his son's pain, helped him leave, and gave him a letter to his beloved. It wasn't his father's fault that Timothy didn't arrive in time. Timothy once saw Marissa, quite unexpectedly, ten years after their last meeting. He remembered that October day as a world of rain and wind. He had sought refuge in a nearby cafe and had just settled at a table when he felt someone's gaze on him. Marissa? he whispered. She smiled at him, her presence brightening the gloomy day. Marissa, are you here alone? Alone, she whispered with a nice smile, raising her glass of juice. Cheers. They chinked his coffee cup and her glass. How are you, Timothy? I moved here after high school, graduated from college, and now I'm working, he said. Marissa sipped her juice. I was sorry I couldn't say goodbye to you. I was afraid you'd be upset. Well, of course I was upset, but your mother told me that it wasn't your fault. I wrote to you several times, but when you didn't respond, I thought— My mother intercepted your letters, Timothy said. My father found them and gave them to me. I came looking for you. Yes, she told me. It doesn't matter, Timothy. I'm just so glad we met. I thought I'd never see you again. And what about your life? He smiled. I suppose you've got kids already. Marissa sighed and shook her head. Actually, no. I often go to the city, to the clinic. They say I'm fine. I guess... She sighed again. It's just not time yet. And your husband, are you living well? Timothy asked. Marissa smiled nonchalantly. All sorts out in our life. They talked until the evening, and realized it only when it was already dark outside the windows. You've probably been waited for at home by now, aren't you? Marissa shrugged. When I come here, I always tell my husband that I'm staying at the clinic overnight. But, in fact... Marissa laughed, seeing the confusion on his face. I don't have a lover. It's just so nice to go shopping, buy yourself something, or go to the movies, or sit in a cafe. It's my own personal sip of freedom. I've never really been free. First my parents had me on a tight leash, then my aunt, and then my husband. She spoke candidly, not dodging answers or trying to be sly. She's always been like that. You haven't changed a bit, Timothy said, looking at her fondly. Yes, there were wrinkles under her eyes, and her lips were not as vibrant as they once were, but Timothy didn't pay any attention to these minor details. The spark of true magic lay in her infectious laughter and the innocent expression in her eyes. This was his Marissa, his first love, who had completely turned his life around. Do you want to go somewhere else? Maybe to the movies? Timothy asked. Marissa traced her finger over the frosty glass, filled generously with ice by the bartender. How can she drink such a cold juice in this weather? He wondered. I don't want to go to the movies, she said finally. I want to come to you. The next morning, Timothy woke up to find that Marissa had already left. The scent of her hair still lingered on the pillow, and a note lay on the table with just one word. Thank you. There was no other message, no phone number, nothing. No one at the cafe remembered Marissa. It became clear to Timothy that she had been there by chance, and all he could do was cherish their fleeting encounter and continue with his life. Mum could never become happy, even though Timothy now had enough money to support her. She was never content. Just like during his childhood, she always found reasons to criticize and insult him. One day he realized he would never be good enough for his mother, and it was futile to try pleasing her. From that point onwards, Timothy lived a quiet life, no longer seeking his mother's love and approval. And he was living quite well, I must say, until the previous year, when a neighbor informed him that his mother had slipped on her way back from the store. It turned out that she had fractured her femoral neck, resulting in a cast and a bleak prognosis. Don't worry, Timothy, the head doctor reassured him when he arrived to the hospital. Yes, the injury is severe, but your mother is quite healthy for her age. I believe she'll recover soon. 
The mother greeted him with a strained smile. "'I'm a cripple now,' she whispered. "'I can never stand again.' "'You will be able,' Timothy promised. "'As soon as you're discharged, we'll go to my place. "'You'll get physical therapy, massages. "'We'll hire a nurse to help you walk. "'You'll be walking before you know it.' "'His mother smiled, her face as pale as a sheet of paper. "'In due time, Timothy took his mother to his place. "'However, as usual, nothing seemed to satisfy her. "'She showed no interest in physical therapy, "'made no attempt to stand.' and the first two nurses left within a week, due to her demanding nature. Only the current nurse, Valerie, could handle her. Timothy paid her generously, and did not hesitate to agree to a high payment, as long as she stayed. And now he couldn't believe that his mother had voluntarily become disabled just to be taken care of. He didn't finish his thought. The phone screen displayed the nurse's number. Before he could answer... Valerie's urgent shout rang out. "'Timothy, come back immediately. I don't know what to do. Your mum saw Avery, and—' "'I'm coming,' shouted Timothy, without listening to the end. As he burst into the apartment, the nurse emerged, carrying a frightened Avery in her arms. From his mother's room came anguished screams. "'You filthy brat! No children in my house! I don't want to see her! Throw her out!' "'It's all right. Girls,' Timothy whispered, moving towards his mother's room. "'I'll handle this.' Inside he saw his mother wreaking havoc and smashing anything within reach. Vases, candy bowls, cups. What a scene! "'Throw her out!' she shrieked. "'Out! Out!' Seeing her son, she froze momentarily before collapsing to the floor. "'Timothy, help me!' she pleaded, reaching out to him. Help me up! I've been here for a while, Mum, he responded quietly, and I saw you moving around. You're imagining things. I couldn't reach Valerie, so I tried to get to the bookshelf, and then... You managed to reach it, Timothy said, looking at the books scattered on the floor. Go back to bed. I'll ask Valerie to give you a sedative. Son! He left the room. The nurse and Avery were still standing in the hallway. "'Give me the girl,' he said, "'and give Mum something to calm her down. "'She seems to have gotten too excited.' "'Well, you, young lady,' he said, turning to Avery, "'it wouldn't help to get some sleep. "'We'll warm some milk and honey now, "'and when you fall asleep, "'I'll start looking for your mummy and daddy.' "'I don't want to go home,' the girl begged. "'Daddy yells at Mum, beats her, "'and then beats me, saying that he wanted a boy.' "'and I was born a girl. No one needs me.' "'Hush, hush,' he whispered to the sobbing girl. "'Let's calm down. I'll think about what we can do. "'Do you love your mum?' "'I do.' "'Well, there you go. Your mum needs to know where you are. She's worried. "'Do you remember her phone number?' "'Her phone number is on the tag of her overalls,' said Avery. "'Here, take a look.' "'Great, so that solves something,' Timothy smiled. Let's go drink some milk, and I'll call your mum right now. A woman answered the phone. From her hoarse and nervous voice, filled with sobs, it was impossible to determine her age. Are you Avery's mum? he asked. Yes, yes I am. What's wrong with her? My name is Timothy. Avery is at my house right now. She's fine. I found her in the woods. Please come and pick up your daughter. Is she, is she okay? She's... The woman choked on her tears. As gently as possible, Timothy reassured. Calm down. Everything is fine. I'll let Avery speak to you now. Avery smiled happily. Mummy, she shouted. I was lost, but Timothy found me. He gave me pancakes, and he has many rooms and a good nanny. Mummy, will you come get me? I'll be there soon, very soon, the mother screamed. Wait for me, daughter. Mummy's coming announced the little girl. So we'll wait for her, said Timothy. You haven't changed your mind about sleeping yet. And Mummy? She'll wake you up. In the meantime, let's go. He took the girl into the guest room, laid her on the sofa, and wrapped her with a fluffy plaid. You can imagine that you are lying in a bear's den, Timothy said, and next to the bear 
is sniffling in his sleep, and you are basking against him, and you are warm, warm. It's great, isn't it? Is the bear kind? Asked the sleepy girl. Kind, wise, and brave," said Timothy. "He will make sure you don't get cold, and he won't let anyone hurt you. He will treat you with honey, the most fragrant and delicious, and also." But the little girl was already asleep. Timothy smoothed her dishevelled hair. "Sleep, my little friend," he whispered, and left the room. The nurse was waiting for him in the kitchen. "I've injected a sedative. Your mother is sleeping," she reported. Good," Timothy said, pouring himself a cup of coffee. "Now tell me what has happened here." Valerie looked at him confused. "Timothy, honestly, I went to make a bath for the girl. Then your mother called me and asked, 'What's that childish voice?' I told her it was your friend's daughter. And then I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know. And then what happened?" Valerie sighed, rubbing her palm across her forehead, and continued, "Your mother said." Bring her in. I want to see her. I called Avery. Your mother started questioning her about her identity, and her mother's name. Suddenly she lum. Suddenly she jumped up and lunged at the girl. I barely managed to shield Avery. Your mother started screaming. You must have heard her. She ran around the room in that state. But you know that before she couldn't even take a step because she always claimed it hurt to step on her feet. Yes, I know. I quickly picked up Avery and ran out. I locked her to your study and immediately called you. I believe you, Valerie. The man said, "Have some tea and calm down. We both had a hard day, and I'll wait for Avery's mum." He didn't have long to wait. The doorbell rang just as he finished his sentence. "I'll get it," said Timothy, standing up. Then there was a long silence, so long that it made Valerie worry. She had no idea that a haggard. And trembling, Marissa was standing at the door. Timothy, Marissa stammered, "Is that you?" He silently took her hand and pulled her close. Marissa started sobbing. "I thought, I thought, shh, it's okay, Marissa. Avery is asleep. Do you want to see her now? Let's go." Marissa knelt in front of her sleeping daughter, her hands fumbling as they touched the little girl's hair and adjusted the plaid. "Let her sleep a bit." Timothy whispered, "She's had an exhausting day. Let's go talk." He led her to his study and settled her into a chair. Marissa's hands were shaking. "We'll get through this," he promised, procuring a bottle and glass from the bar. "I don't. Just take it," he insisted, making her sip. "Take a sip and then again." Marissa obediently sipped, squinted her eyes, but swallowed. "That's it. Good job." Now tell me everything from the start. And she began. When I got married, Glenn said he needed me to bear children. He wanted at least five boys. He didn't love me, but he believed that since I was young, everything would be fine. But it didn't turn out fine. Timothy whispered. Yes, he was so angry. He beat me, claiming I was disgracing him. He pointed out that others had three children. And were expecting a fourth, whereas I couldn't give birth to one. His mother took me to some woman who prepared herbal concoctions for me to drink, as unpleasant as they were. We eventually went to the clinic for a checkup. They told me there was nothing wrong and suggested my husband get checked instead. But I didn't tell him. He would have beaten me again for even suspecting it. I told him I would go for treatment, and I finally got pregnant. I thought Glenn would be ecstatic, but all he said was, "Even a useless sheep gives some wool." Of course, he expected a son, but we had a daughter instead. He was furious, constantly shouting about not wanting to feed an unnecessary family, claiming a girl was only a loss unlike a son. But I didn't pay attention to his words. Why should I? I had a lovely daughter. Lately, he had been acting strange. Smirking at our daughter, I even thought he might have gotten attached to her. Today he said he was taking her for a walk in the woods, but he came back alone. He said she got lost and he couldn't find her. Wait a minute, Timothy interrupted. Could Avery be my daughter? 
things didn't work out with your husband, and then her age is matching. Marissa, tell me the truth. Is Avery my daughter? She responded with a long look, then gave a slight nod. I wanted it very much. When I left you that morning, I was hopeful, and it turned out to be for a good reason, said Marissa. Timothy rubbed his chin and replied, Well, you realize I won't let my daughter go to that monster, and neither will you. You can stay here, right here, today, now. We'll formalize your divorce. Do you want to go back to him? Marissa grinned bitterly. Who in their right mind would want to go back to him? Well, that's settled. Then you're both staying. First, we'll... Throw her out, came from behind the door. Then the door swung open and Marissa's mother entered the room. She walked confidently past Marissa and sat in a neighboring chair. This one, the woman pointed contemptuously at the guest, isn't part of my plans. I didn't give birth to you, Timothy, for you to get married and forget about your mother. You're supposed to be my help in my old age, not... So, you're walking well, right? interrupted Timothy. You have finally recovered. Then why have you been pretending to be weak all these months? Throw her out, came from behind the door. Then the door swung open and his mother entered the room. She walked confidently past Marissa and sat in a neighboring chair. Mum, this is my home, said Timothy, and I make decisions here and I've already decided. My future wife and my daughter will live here. If you don't like it, you're free to leave, especially since you don't seem to need any more help from me or the medical team. His mother sighed convulsively, her eyes brimming with tears. This is how you treat me. I always knew you were like your father. I didn't just want to believe it, but I was told. I was warned one day. Her voice trembled. You will remember me when your children do the same to you. And you, she glared at Marissa with a hateful look. I knew you were mean, spoiled and insolent from the start. I advised your mother and aunt to marry you off to Glen. What? Marissa gasped. You? But how? I knew everything that was happening to you. I watched you through your mother. I found Glen and hoped that you'd be far away from my son. But you found a way to get back. Remember, Timothy, if you marry this viper, you're no longer my son. I don't want to see you or your children. I will never accept her. Now I'm leaving. I'm going back to my apartment because my own son has kicked me out of his house. With these words, the woman stood up and, with determined steps, headed for the exit. Secondary benefits, Timothy muttered. What? Marissa asked. Nothing important. I'm sorry I got you caught in this scandal. I didn't realize it myself until today. The front door slammed loudly as the mother left, and confused Valerie knocked on the door. Timothy, your mother just left. She got dressed and left, and I... It's all right, Valerie, the man said. She doesn't need your services any more. But if you need a job, maybe you could stay with us. You could be a nanny for my daughter, Avery. Valerie nodded, smiled, and, most importantly, didn't ask a single question. Mummy, you're here! A disheveled little girl from her nap ran into the office. Marissa jumped up and held out her arms. Avery! Yes, Avery, your mum is here now. Timothy replied with a smile. And you know, we have talked and decided that it's better for us to live together. Mum doesn't mind, does she? Marissa answered him with such a radiant smile that there could be no doubt. She was only in favour. You know, she whispered in Timothy's ear, I always hoped that one day you would find me and this nightmare would end. He put his arms around her and lightly kissed her temple. Now all the nightmares are behind us. Only good things await our family. What about your mum? Marissa asked. Is she going to be... As for mum, I'll give her money to cover everything, but then, I don't know. It's too painful for me to discuss right now. I'm simply not ready for this. Rachel, the neighbour said reproachfully, you can say whatever you want, but you still have a good son. If he were good, 
He'd be concerned about his mother's old age, not some woman, retorted Rachel. Her voice was so full of conviction that it momentarily frightened the neighbor. Rachel, she said gently, have you ever loved anyone in your life? Not in your way, but genuinely, like people usually do. Are you implying I never loved my son? I carried him for nine months. I was constantly sick, swelled up like a hippopotamus, and had a twenty-four hour labor. Then I never got any sleep, just feeding him constantly. But did he ever refuse you anything? He's still giving you money. I don't need his money. Oh, come on. You claim you don't need his money, but you take them. There's something wrong with what you're saying. Rachel sighed, her voice laced with tears. What choice do I have? I'm a poor, ill pensioner. I'm forced to accept this charity, even though I don't want to. Well, well, the neighbor smirked. You're not being truthful again, Rachel. You're upset because your son isn't under your thumb any more. You wanted him to remain attached to your apron strings forever, but he's married, has a child, and moved on. He abandoned me for her. He cast aside his own mother to be with her, Rachel cried out. I can't even bear to utter her name. You're twisting the truth. You left of your own accord and spent a year causing trouble to him before that. You wanted Timothy to abandon everything and chase after you, didn't you? I am his mother, answered Rachel with dignity. It's my right. The neighbor shook her head. You're a piece of work, Rachel. I'll leave you to it. There is nothing I can speak with you any more. Rachel gazed out the window. It was a blooming July. The hot summer sun had cooled, giving way to a warm evening. Children's laughter echoed from the playground. Though she hadn't admitted it to her neighbor, Rachel had once boarded a train to Timothy's city. She hesitated to ring the doorbell, sitting on a bench in the shade. Suddenly a hopeful thought crossed her mind. Perhaps Timothy has already sent that woman and her child away. Maybe she could return to his apartment to live together again. He was upset with her, but it wasn't a big deal. She could explain that she had spoken out of turn in the heat of the moment. She would find the right words. Suddenly she noticed her son. He carried Avery on his shoulders and held Marissa's hand. They were chatting and laughing. The worst part was that the vile woman, that serpent, was pregnant again. She shamelessly caressed her large belly, looking incredibly pleased with herself. The sight made Rachel want to leap up and make a scandal. How dare she steal my only son, take my place, impose her brood, and get pregnant again? She did all this deliberately, the wretch. Rachel seethed. She planned all this to make sure Timothy wouldn't leave her. She's a wicked woman. Filled with indignation and a sense of helpless despair, she returned home, collapsed onto her bed, and burst into tears, pounding her fists into her pillow. It was clear that her son was happy with his family, while she had been cast aside. The neighbor was right. Rachel dreamed of her son, devoting his life to her and her happiness. But would he be happy at that? Once it seemed to her that otherwise and could not be. Maybe she was wrong, and maybe it was not so bad that he created his own family and raised children. After all, he did continue their lineage. Rachel looked longingly at the yard where neighborhood grandmothers sat on a bench, leisurely conversing while their grandchildren played in the sandpit or the playground. I could do that too, Rachel sighed bitterly. For the first time, her heart filled with sadness for her unfamiliar grandchildren. The next morning, the woman went to the candy store, where she bought a huge cake and then took the train. When she found herself at the door of Timothy's apartment, she suddenly felt that her courage was leaving her. What if they don't open the door for me, or even if they do, but give me harsh words and throw me out like a stray dog? I won't survive that, Rachel fretted. However, did she buy that cake and travel two hours on the train in vain? She had to decide, so she rang the bell. 
Timothy opened the door. He appeared so surprised to see his mother, as if he didn't recognize her initially. Hello, Timothy, the woman said softly. I've come to tell you, I was wrong, wrong about many things. I thought you should only belong to me. That's why I gave birth to you. I was only taking care of myself, and I didn't see, I didn't realize how much you've done for me. And now, all of a sudden, you've realized everything, haven't you? He asked. Well, I had time to think about everything and recognize what loneliness is. I want to be a good mother, not selfish, and a good grandmother, if you'll let me. He glanced at the box of cake. Did you bring this for us? For you. I thought maybe we could have tea together. Timothy, his wife called out to him. Are we having guests? Marissa approached her husband and froze in place, looking at Rachel. She held a plump baby asleep in her arms. Marissa, Rachel said, I've come to visit, but first I want to apologize for, for everything I've done to your life. Marissa looked questioningly at her husband. He put his hand on her waist. Well, you've apologized. And perhaps you really have rethought things. In that case, welcome. Marissa sliced the cake and placed it on plates. The kitchen was warm and smelled of fragrant tea. Rachel sat at the table, holding Avery on her lap, and suddenly felt a strange feeling of happiness and calmness. Her family was with her, and it was wonderful. Just to love them.